mighty wind. It filled their hearts with singing and gave them peace within. The prophet gave his promise. The spirit And from your inner being, a river with no end, there is a river that flows from deep within. That frees the soul from sin. Come to this water. There is a vast supply. There is a river that never shall. a thirsty woman who was drawing from a well her life was ruined and wasted her soul was bound for hell then she met the master told of her great sin and if you drink this water you never thirst again there is a river that flows from God That's filled with His great love. Come to this water. There is a vast supply. There is a river that never shall. that never shall run dry. Parables in this uh, chapter, we call it the parable of the prodigal son. It's lo the longest, most detailed, and to be honest with you, it is the most emotionally impacting of the three parables. And, you know, it's just been one of those Parables that, uh, well, people have thought it's one of the, maybe possibly one of the greatest stories ever told in this world. And I think there's a lot of very good and useful information. It's chock full of lessons. It really is. And we want to go ahead and try and bring some of those lessons out here this morning. Obviously, there's way too much material in this parable to do it all. Okay, I mean, just to let you know, there are three main characters or players in the parable. Uh, there is a father, which to us anyways will represent God the Father. When we were in the parable of the, you know, the, the shepherd that went out to seek the one missing sheep, well, we knew that that was talking about Jesus, our good sheep, our good shepherd who came to seek and to save the lost. Uh, that woman, well, that was uh, the church that has been commissioned to go ahead and reach the lost now that Jesus is up there. But we understood last week 
that really for her to do that job, she must be illuminated and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so we saw a, a kind of a special reference to the need for the Holy Spirit to work in and through the body or bride of Christ in this world right now. And now we're going to be looking at the one in which the Father and his great and unmatchable love is bestowed. Um, the two sons also are significant in this parable. Um, all along it was triggered by the objection. Uh, his critics said, you know, you're, you're hanging out, you're hobnobbing with sinners. You're actually receiving them. You're eating with them. W what is with this? This isn't what we do. And Jesus Christ said earlier, back in Luke chapter 5, clarified that it is what he did because he came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. And he realized that it really wasn't the self-righteous that had need of a physician, but they that were sick that needed to be made whole. And so he was going out intentionally on, on purpose in order to go to those who had need of the grace that only he could give. Now they're continuing to complain about that and to be honest with you the older brother when we get to that part which that won't be this week when we get to the older brother that represents these pharisees these detractors who had been so upset with christ for going after and having a heart for the lost but the main character of the parable is the one that we really want to focus on here today and that's the younger son and basically, there are a couple of portraits that I want to bring out, one this week and one next week. So this week, what we're going to do, we're going to have a portrait of a man following his own heart. We're going to see that's exactly what this younger son does. He's following his own heart. He is making a break from tradition, from the teaching in the heritage of his family and of his faith community. He is striking out for something totally different. And so he's going to follow his own heart. And we're going to take an honest look where that leads. Because <laughs> there's a lot of people that think that's a good way to live. And then we're also going to see the portrait of a man returning to God. We'll do that next week. okay? And that's when all of a sudden the madness ends. And he comes to himself. He like regains a measure of sanity. And he goes through this deliberative process in the which he is brought back to, to, to God the Father. And, you know, that's going to be a very touching part. But let's go ahead and read the whole parable right now for continuity's sake. Like I said, it's one of the best stories ever told in this world, I think. We'll pick it up there at verse number 11. And we'll read down to the end of the chapter. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together. And he took his journey into a far country. And there... He wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want. And he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough in despair, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven 
and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. He didn't get a chance to finish his speech. And um, because we read there in the next verse, the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things might mean, what these things meant. And he said unto him, Well, your brother is come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. And the brother he was angry, and he would not go in. And therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet you never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends, but as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet, it was fit, it was proper that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother, he was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, like I said, what I want to do now is I want to go ahead and draw a portrait, or actually allow Jesus Christ to draw that portrait from this story of what happens to a man when he decides to follow his own heart. And if ever there was a generation on this earth that needed to have this portrait, I think ours is that generation. We live in a day when men consider that their own hearts are their best and surest guides to bring them forth in the world. Matter of fact, all we have to do is look at the popular slogans that proliferate on social media and amongst people. They're always saying things like, you know, be true to yourself, right? Be true to yourself because only you can do you. You are a unique you and packed into you and your heart is the ability to be someone so special, but you gotta be authentic, right? You gotta be true to your own heart. You gotta trust it, you gotta believe it. You gotta go ahead and, with courage, set out to do your heart's desire, right? All the answers, all the answers are within you already. That's where to look for the answers, by the way. You look in here. They're prepackaged in here. And what you gotta do is just live the dream. Trust your gut. Follow your instincts, and above all, believe in yourself. Because if you believe in yourself, your heart is never going to steer you wrong. Do we not hear this kind of stuff all the time? Isn't that like a pervasive philosophy that's out there that people are actually being taught? That rather than following the doctrines and the dogmas and the rules of an outdated, antiquated generation... That, you know, they want to pass down their heritage and their legacy, but it's not necessarily convenient to the desires of people nowadays. And you have to cut and run. You have to make a break with tradition. You have to follow your own heart. And so people, they almost view life as an opportunity for self-discovery and self-expression. And it's gone so far that we've actually, in our, in our society, it's, it's, it's gone crazy they're so willing to allow their heart to be true that facts objective and biological cannot compete with what the heart feels and thinks it is actually at this point in time for permissible for people to identify as 
different genders than they are biologically or different races than they are genetically or even different species. You say, that's not possible. They actually do. They have what's called a furry movement out there. I'm not making it up, people. They actually will allow these people that want to be furries, they can identify with, you know, dogs or foxes or whatever they want. It's, it's crazy. And, and, you know, there's, it's, it's actually a kind of insanity, but it's all... It's all exonerated and accepted on this this kind of philosophy that really it comes from Rousseau. And it, and it really got ahead of steam back in the 60s in the counterculture movement where that was the creedal cry. Now, it was to be true to yourself, and everybody bought into it. The worst expression of that whole philosophy that I ever saw in print, as a matter of fact, I'll read it right off where I got it. This is... It was written by Dr. Henry Morris of the Institute for Creation Research. Let me read this. It's from a 1983 book written by a guy by the name of Jeremy Rifkin. And Jeremy Rifkin wrote the book called Algeny. And towards the very end, this is how he closed that book. We no longer feel ourselves to be guests in someone else's home and therefore obliged to make our behavior conform with a set of pre-existing cosmic rules. No, no. It is our creation. Now, we make the rules. We establish the parameters of reality. We create the world. And because we do, we no longer feel beholden to outside forces. We no longer have to justify our behavior, for we are now the architects of the universe. We are responsible to nothing outside of ourselves, for we are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. End quote. Can you believe that? Now, what is that? That is taking the crown off the head of God Almighty and setting it on yourself and say, you be true to yourself. To thine own self be true. Your heart will never lead you wrong. And yet everywhere we look in the Bible, the Bible says, don't trust your own heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. And the man that just gives way to follow it, to follow all of his wanton desires, his baser passions, he's going to go off in a direction into which he's eventually going to come to destitution to degradation. And Jesus Christ actually shows us in picture form that very thing happening here in this parable. So here's what I want to go ahead and do. We're going to look at this guy bit by bit, verse by verse, and the first thing that we're struck by is his willfulness. Look, if you will, please, at verse number 12. <clears throat> and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And so he divided unto them his living. Now, this, the way this guy put it across his younger son, it was, it was a demand. It was a demand that he had absolutely no right to, to make. It was a presumptuous, impatient, and purely selfish demand. That, now, it was possible in those days for, um, you know, a father to go ahead and put into possession of his kids, or at least to divide his stuff so that everybody knew in advance who would get what, right? So it would it'd be possible for him to do this at least on paper so that the kid would know what he had coming and the older brother, which, by the way, the older brother would have gotten the double portion, so this younger brother that's asking for it, he stands to get one-third of the wealth, and the older brother stands to get two-thirds of the wealth, and they really both stand to get it when? They, they, they stand to get it on the day when their father dies. Now, you know, I've talked to people. We, we sometimes do a similar thing to what they used to do back there in ancient Israel. The, the father could, uh, or, the, you know, the mother in that case, the, the parents, they can decide who gets what amongst their children. And don't we do that? I mean, you know, it's like uh, I've, I've talked to some people. They say that their, their parents will like put their names underneath certain items, which, you know, when they're, when they're gone, 
then the ownership is proved by the fact that their name will be on a piece of item. You all you have to do is pick up and turn over the chair or whatever it is, the table or whatever it is, and it's clearly marked who it's going to belong to. So there is an ownership right there that is guaranteed. But you know what you wouldn't do? Even though you know that in a certain sense you possess that because it's being bequeathed to you, you wouldn't walk into your mother's house and just say, um, you know that, that chair that's mine? I'm taking it. I, I'm going to liquidate it because I got plans. She might be using that. You know, that's just the height of rudeness. And it was the same way back then. What he, if you want to put it in le legal terms, this, this son, he didn't want just the right of possession. He also wanted the right of disposition, which means he wanted to be able to confiscate and liquidate everything that he had coming to him that was his part of the inheritance. And that's, you know, it's almost as if he was saying, you know, Dad, I can't wait for you to die. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to wait for you to die. Let me know what's mine. I'm going to take what's mine. And I don't want it. And I don't want your farm. I just want the money that it represents. And I'll take what part is coming to me and I'll liquidate it and I'll, and I'll do what I want to do. Um, this is what Richard Trench, he was a guy in the Anglican church in England back in the Victorian era. He said, to put this in legal terms, the younger son wanted, wait, here, the prodigal demanded his share in a technical and almost legal form as a right, as a right, not as a favor, right? It's almost, he, he had that kind of uh, mentality that we see prevalent today where he felt that, you know, it he was entitled to it. He was just entitled to it. Now, I want to just go ahead and raise the question of why, because it was obviously a presumptuous demand. And I don't believe that it happened suddenly. I don't think that all of a sudden he just, you know, like the, the idea just suddenly popped into his head and he decided to take this extraordinary step of imposing this demand upon his father. Quite to the contrary, there had been a building of desire, of wanton desire in the younger son's heart for quite some time so that finally, eventually, he just, he knew what he wanted his desires increased in pressure, and finally he just crossed the Rubicon of his conscience to go ahead and make a demand that was unreasonable and not loving of any son to do. And you know, I've mentioned this uh, before many times to you, but you know, sometimes life gets down to this. There's only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. And this younger son, at that moment, he was all in for pleasing himself. He was a lover of pleasure, we're going to find out, more than a lover of God. Now that matches what we see going on in the world today. And so we note not only the fact that his willfulness, but we also note his waywardness. If you look at verse number 13, here's what we read. It says, in not many days after... He willfully demanded and received his inheritance. Not we, we, It's plainly evident what he wanted it for because almost immediately he gathered all of it together and he took his journey into a far country. He hit the road. He put as much distance between himself and his father as he could. He beat feet, the Bible said, for a far country. Um, I guess he suffered from what uh, the Germans, they have a word for it, fernui, fernui. And what that is, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's basically, it means far sickness. It means that you have this desire that's building in your heart, your heart for remote places and to go out and see a wanderlust. You know, you got itching feet. He wanted to get out and about. And part of the reason was because while he was at home, he was under rules that was established by his father. And he was tired of, you know, his father's rules caused him to suppress what he truly wanted in life. And so eventually, when he got what he wanted, we see that he, you know, he just, he ran faster than the nagging voice of conscience. He hurried 
to get out of the earshot of reason so that nobody could point out what a mistake that he was making. He tried to outrun the shadow of his own doubt and he went to a far nation. Implication is it was a Gentile nation. And he thought he was doing well and wisely and getting what he wanted. He was sort of like Pinocchio, you know? You guys remember the old Pinocchio thing where he goes to Pleasure Island? And he thinks that it's such a wonderful thing. He doesn't know that when you get to, Pino- when you get to Pleasure Island, you get turned into a donkey or some such thing. Well, sin will change you. There can be a metamorphosis of character and soul. When you strike off after what you think is Pleasure Island, you better be careful. He left Mayberry for Las Vegas, is basically what he did. And uh, <clears throat> to be honest with you, this young man, he's an individual, and he made this at an individual level. So we can look around in our society and we can see other individuals, okay? that uh, we could say, well, wow, look at that, that person, that individual. They really, they took off from God. They, they just totally forsook and abandoned the, the heritage that was bequeathed to them, the legacy and traditions of good things from the past. It's like they're trying to put as much distance between holy living, between a faith community as they possibly can. And whereas you can... Apply that to an individual. You know what? I see in this this son almost like a paradigm for viewing Western civilization itself. Do you know what I'm saying? Our culture is doing at a collective level what this son was doing as an individual. All those... um, sayings that I read and those bits of philosophy, those ideas that came from Rousseau and others that are actually counseling people to leave, to beat feet for a far country. Those are things that we see happening in the world around us. And I tell you what, people, I, I, I will say this, that it is a dangerous situation. Whenever a windfall of wealth comes your way. You know, if your proverbial ship should ever happen to come in, all of a sudden when it arrives and you are suddenly liberated with this great power of spending, that is a time of testing. Now, this young man was all predisposed to spend what he had selfishly on his own desires. And that brings us to the third thing. Not only was he wayward and willful, we see that his life was characterized by great wastefulness, by great wastefulness. Um, let's finish reading there in verse number 13 where we left off. It says, he took his journey into a far country and there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all. Now, that word there in verse 13 that's translated substance, he wasted his substance with riotous living, that is actually the same exact word in the Greek that is translated as goods in verse number 12. So in verse number 12, he issues the demand, give me my goods. And then in verse number 13, he wasted those goods that he received in the transaction. As a matter of fact, the very word prodigal, did you know the word prodigal? It means to be recklessly wasteful. He squandered his wealth in the wildest extravagance. That word translated wasted means to scatter abroad, right? Riotous living, that's ruinous living. That's living in which he's not living for the sake of tomorrow. He's living exclusively for the pleasure of the moment. And that means that he's going to be falling further and further into economic harm. And, you know, all we have to do is the the examples are abounding. You know, alcohol is very expensive. I, uh... I, I go sometimes, once in a while, I'll go to a, a restaurant where they actually serve it, you know. And I look at those prices, and I see people around me, well-dressed people that, you know, they can afford it. 
and uh, ordering drinks and cocktails and glasses of wine. Bring out a bottle of this, you know, to go with my fettuccine or whatever, and they'll have a nice body, bottle of wine on their table or something like that. I've often wondered how much they're spending there, but I know that they're spending an awful lot. Um, and, and not only that, you know, when you do drink, if you drink too much, it impairs your judgment. And then all kinds of things can happen. You can become more of a spendthrift. You can do things impulsively, which that can mean the squandering of even more money. Um, you're liable to have your insurance rates uh, raised up. You could wind up losing time at work. Uh, cigarettes are expensive. Now, they weren't so expensive when I was a kid. And, you know, from the age of 17 to the age of around about 25, I quit in the Navy. Of all the times I quit, I used to smoke when I was a teenager. I was an unsaved teenager, and I smoked, okay? I got into the Navy, and I'd received Christ, and I quit. And it was hard. It was way, way, way harder to quit smoking those cigarettes than it ever was to quit drinking, right? I quit both of those things after I got saved. But it was hard. And I, and I just, you know, I am a, appalled now when I see how much. I, does anybody actually even know what a package of cigarettes runs nowadays? How much? I've seen them as high as nine forty nine. You know what? If you if you got a pack a day habit, it won't take very long before you just spent the money for a new car. Really? Over the course of years? I mean, well, three hundred and sixty five days a year, and if you if you buy if ten dollars a, a you know a day, that's a lot. So, anyways. And uh, everything that, that happens in our culture, whether it's gambling in the form of lotto tickets or casinos, I mean, you just think of what this young man was wasting. And someday we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to give an account to the Lord who make us. And we don't want to waste anything. You know, you don't want to waste your time. You don't want to waste your opportunities. You don't want to waste your talents or your abilities, or those resources that he has put in front of you. These are things that you never get back, and your life here is a seed time. And it can be so very, very wasteful. And actually, if you look down there at verse number 30, look at verse number 30. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, you have killed for him the fatted calf. You know, the book of Proverbs says, He that keepeth company with harlots spendeth his substance. And I'm sure they do. And not only, not only are you going to be spending your substance on wicked pleasures, but then there's going to be health ramifications and all kinds of things. So basically what happened, he took all of this wonderful thing, this wealth that his father had bequeathed him, and he poured it out like water, like a libation for this life that he wanted to live that was according to his heart's desire. And when we allow our hearts to run ungovernable in the direction that they want to go, Ignoring the things of the Lord, the law, the constraints that our godly parents or our churches or society, this book would put upon us, that's what happens. It happens every time. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. And then last of all... <clears throat> Not only uh, do we note his great wastefulness, we see where his great wastefulness climaxes. At length, we find that he himself, he himself is wasted. It's not a good thing to be wasted. I know that in the, you know, in the drug and alcohol culture, they have this, this, this phrase, oh, you're, they're getting wasted. You know, and they almost, the way they say that, they're getting wasted. It's almost like they think that that is like some kind of a wise thing. And it is the most foolish thing. But all of a sudden, 
we look here in verses 14 through 16, and let's see what happens here that all of a sudden this prodigal is brought to the point <clears throat> where God, no, no, there's going to be a mercy in this part. When we get to the point where we're right here, where he's going to hit rock bottom, I want you to understand, we don't like to think about it, people hitting rock bottom, but this is where mercy begins, right here. Verse 14, and when he had spent all, and he chose to do that. He chose to spend. Maybe not so fast, but he chose that. But then when he had nothing, there arose a mighty famine in the land. Now, God sent that, okay? And, you know, if he had been in his own land, he went to a far distant land. If he'd have been back in his own land, he wouldn't have experienced this. He, he, uh, he, he, he began to be in want. And he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he, the citizen, sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the pods, the bean pods, the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave to him. There is so much in that right there. What state did he wind up in? Number one, he was empty. He spent all. Number two, he was endangered because a mighty famine arose in the land. You know, and it's, it's not good uh, to, to, to be poor. But it's worse to be poor in a time of famine because all of a sudden food grows scarce in a famine and of necessity it's every man for himself right but if it's a mighty famine and you have nothing you are empty he realized that he was at the point where he could die and he had to do something about it so he was not only empty and endangered he wound up becoming enslaved it says he joined himself to a citizen of that country a man that did not love him, but, uh, you know, he was a foreigner. He was a Jew from, oh, yeah, a Jew. Yeah, yeah, where are you from? Like Jew, or Jerusalem, Bethlehem, you from over there, huh? Yeah, well, you know what? You're going to work, and I want you to go out and feed my hogs. And that would have been the height of degradation to the Jewish people because of, according to their laws, they did not have hog farmers in Israel, okay? They didn't, they didn't eat them. They didn't work with them. So that would have been when probably when Jesus told this part of the story, all of the people in his audience would have thought, oh, he's tending pigs? You can't get any worse than that. But he was not only enslaved, he was emaciated. He fain would fill his belly with the husks. And he was excluded and no man gave unto him well actually we're going to reverse that next week there is someone that's going to give to him um here's the thing when we get to next week i want to show you how in all these circumstances it came upon a man that decided to put his own heart's desire first and run in the way of his own he turned to his own way and took off after his own passions this is what happens when you do that. And yet there is a God who is a loving Father who sees all things and is willing to forgive. And it's very, very important. So I hope you get a chance to hear next week's message because that portrait is going to be a, a portrait of a man returning to God, returning to his senses and returning to God. And that is always and ever a possibility and one that our generation nowadays need let's pray heavenly father we are so very grateful lord for all you do i want to thank you heavenly father i know lord we all of us we know examples lord of people lord they have turned to our own way as a matter of fact lord i can look at my own life and there were definitely times lord uh, when i had turned to my own way so very grateful lord that you can be found again, that you actually go after the wayward. And, Father, that there is always a place of mercy with you. 
Thank you, Father, for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.